So hooray, you finally made it to your last part of the third of three videos today. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at antepartum hemorrhage as a conclusion on the antepartum hemorrhage chapter or late trimester bleeding. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Remember when we're talking about postpartum hemorrhage, we're pretty much talking about bleeding through the genital tract occurring 24 weeks after gestation up until delivery of the baby. Now, there are some institutes that use a low age of viability that's about 20 weeks. There are others who use a much higher one that's about 28 weeks. And remember that the bleeding is going to be pretty much also inclusive of the first two stages of labor. Remember that bleeding from the third stage of labor and onwards is referred to as postpartum hemorrhage. The in incidence of antepartum hemorrhage or late trimester bleeding is about 4 to 5 percent in all pregnancies. And when it occurs prematurely or prenatally, this is going to quadruple the mortality rates. And then this means that every woman that comes in with antepartum hemorrhage must actually be taken seriously, a full history must be taken. This woman must be examined fully, and of course, investigations must be ordered. Causes can be divided as placenta, which we covered over the past four videos. 70% of the cases are going to be placental, and they carry the risk to both the mother and the fetus. 5% are extra placental causes like cervical or vaginal. 25% are actually unexplained. Placental causes may either be painful Bleeding, one common cause is placenta abruption, which accounts for 30%. And a rare cause is uterine rupture, which accounts for less than 10%. That's another cause of pain, full bleeding. Then, of course, causes of pain, less bleeding is pretty much going to be placenta previa in 20% of the cases, and rarely fascia previa. Cervical causes include cervicitis, cervical erosion, cervical polyps, cervical carcinoma, which is usually unlikely and would warrant to be assessed using a speculum examination. Of course, we will talk about cervical carcinoma. Vaginal causes include vaginal trauma, lacerations, varicosities, vaginal infections. Other causes include early labor in about 50% of the cases, as well as blood dyscrasias. In the approach to the patient, we're pretty much going to want to take a history a physical examination and investigations. What things are we expecting to ask for in the history? So there will be a history of fresh vaginal bleeding. Of course, the key question here is to determine whether the bleeding is placental and it's actually either compromising the mother or compromising the fetus or compromising both, or whether it has a less significant cause. And remember that normally just obviously looking at the mother may actually give you an indication as to whether is she is in extremities or not, or whether she's at risk of morbidity or mortality or not. Of course, in some cases, this may be deceiving. So you should ask when the bleeding started. Was it spontaneous? Was it associated with coitus or was it due to trauma? How much bleeding has happened and for how long? How many pads have been changed? What is the color of the blood? Is it fresh blood or is it not fresh blood? Any clots present in the blood? Any symptoms of anemia like headache? tinnitus, palpitations, fainting, lightheadedness, and is the baby moving, and can the mother feel the baby? What was the last cervical smear? When was it done, and was it normal? And of course, is there any history of trauma? Now remember, when you examine this woman, vital signs are very important, so your pulse and your blood pressure. 
Then of course the state of the uterus also, if it's soft, if it's tender, if it's firm, all these things may be pointing you towards different causes. It's also important that you perform fetal auscultation as well as cardiac cardiotocography and at all costs in all women that come in with bleeding from the vagina after 20 weeks we should do an ultrasound first before actually carrying out a bimanual vaginal or pelvic examination as this may actually exacerbate the bleeding in placenta previa so make sure you rule that out then investigations depend on the degree of bleeding but generally include a full blood count a bedside clotting time, a clotting profile which includes your platelet count, your prothrombin time, your partial thermoplastin time. You could also order for your DIC labs, that's your pretty much your fibrinogen, your D dimers, your peripheral smears, which can show cystocytes, helmet cells, or fragmented cells. Do not forget to get your baselines for your renal function and your kidney function tests. You could also order for a cross match, six units of blood if suspected previa or abruption. Then, of course, your urinalysis must be done. An obstetric ultrasound is pretty much going to ascertain the fetal size, the presentation, the amniotic fluid, the placental position, as well as the morphology. And remember that there are three ways in which we can distinguish between fetal and maternal blood. One way is using the apt test, which I talked about in one of the videos, where we take one mil of the blood, we pretty much add two to three drops of potassium hydroxide to create this stressful environment. And remember that the fetal red blood cells are resistant to this stressful environment and they will not hemolyze so the solution will remain pink or red the maternal red blood cells are not going to be resistant to the stressful environment so they may hemolyze and turn the solution brown so this is one way in which you can distinguish the blood vessels or rather the blood cells then of course the second test is known as a clue beticate test which is pretty much putting blood from the mother's arm and determining the percentage of fetal red blood cells in the maternal circulation. If there are more than 1% of the fetal red blood cells, then most likely the bleeding is of fetal origin. And of course, the fetal red blood cells in the microscopy are going to appear bright red, and this is due to fetal hemoglobin, and while the maternal red blood cells will appear washed out, so they kind of look like ghost cells, empty shells. And of course, you may also do a right stain where vaginal blood is going to be showing nucleated red blood cells, pretty much indicating fetal blood. Now, how do we manage this? So we pretty much want to immediately call for help. We urgently mobilize available staff and initiate resuscitative measures, your ABCs, evaluate the patient's general condition, so pretty much your vital signs. Check the fetal status, that's the fetal heart rate, gain IV access, start running some normal saline, of course, one liter to run wide. Um, and then, of course, this should be given with some caution in patients that are hypertension or hypertensive. Then, of course, instead of all this catheter and monitor the urine output, maintain the systolic blood pressure above 100 and the urine output above 30 mils per hour. Of course, send bloods for full blood count, UNEs, creatinine, bedside clotting time, and of course, your cross match. Do not perform any vaginal examination before you draw your ultrasound. So do your ultrasound and the definitive management largely depends on the etiology of antipartum hemorrhage. If there is fetal jeopardy which is present or the gestational age is very close to 36 weeks, then the goal is to deliver the baby. And of course, complications may be maternal, which are due to hemorrhage, cardiac failure or renal failure, which is seen in 0.5 to 5% of the cases. It may also be due to fetal complications like fetal demise, which is due to fetal hypoxia, exaggeration, draining out of the blood from the uh, body of the fetus. Of course, it may also be due to complications of prematurity, increase in rates of congenital anomalies, as well as intrauterine growth restriction. And of course, here is an algorithm to help you manage a patient that comes in with antipartum hemorrhage. Of course, you're going to have your patient, you assess your maternal condition, you assess your fetal condition, you confirm the gestational age. And of course, if the person is above 36 weeks and the fetus and the mother are stable, then you want to consider what is known as a double setup examination, where you're going to go to theater, you prepare for either vaginal delivery or C-section, and you pretty much examine this woman. When you examine this woman and you determine that it's a placenta previa, then you deliver them via C-section. If there is no placenta previa, then you can examine them to exclude other local causes of bleeding. Then, of course, you manage as abruption. So expected management, plus or minus tocolysis, then, of course, give them beta-methasone, and, of course, possibly a vaginal delivery. 
if they are less than 36 weeks and the mother or the fetus is stable, order for an ultrasound. If there is no placenta previa, manage accordingly. If there is placenta previa, then you want to perform an expected management. And of course, plus or minus tocolysis. Then of course, if there is repetitive bleeding, then if they are unstable, deliver them via C-section. If they are stable, you may perform an amniocentesis where you are certain the lung maturity. If they are mature, then deliver them via C-section. If they're immature, continue with your expected management. Of course, if there's no further bleeding, then of course you want to continue with your amniocentesis. And of course, if it's mature, deliver. If it's not, then wait until it's mature, then you deliver then. If they come in and they're in fatal distress and all the is maternal hemodynamic instability, then pretty much you want to perform your volume and blood replacement. And of course, when they're stabilized, deliver the child. So of course, this is an algorithm that will help you manage the different causes. And I hope you really enjoyed about learning about postpartum hemorrhage. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Drop a like, drop a comment. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevo. Until next time, bye-bye.